Hello, bonjour. Good afternoon to everyone at home. Welcome from the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Bon après-midi et bienvenue de la part du Musée canadien pour les droits de la personne à Winnipeg, au Manitoba. We have a very special program to share this afternoon. Nous présentons un programme bien spécial cet après-midi. I'm Angeliki, Interpretive Program Developer with the Public Programs Team here at the Museum. Je suis Angeliki, conceptrice de programme ici au Musée. Before we begin the program, I would like to share with you the language and accessibility features available in this session. Avant de commencer, je me signaler les fonctions de langue et d'accessibilité que nous offrons pour ce programme. The presentations today will be in English. To access French simultaneous interpretation, select the circular globe icon in the Zoom controls at the bottom of the Zoom window. There you can select the French language channel, and if you would like to hear the interpreted language only, you can select mute original audio. Les présentations d'aujourd'hui seront en anglais. Pour accéder à la interprétation simultanée en français, sélectionnez l'icône du globe dans les commandes de Zoom au bas de votre écran Zoom. Vous pouvez y sélectionner le canal de langue française et si vous souhaitez entendre uniquement la langue interprétée, vous pouvez sélectionner couper la version audio originale. As you may have noticed already, we also have ASL interpretation available for this program. To view the ASL interpreters, click View Options in the top right corner and then select Gallery View. Vous avez probablement déjà remarqué que nous offrons l'interprétation en ASL pour ce programme. Pour voir les interprètes d'ASL, cliquez sur les options d'affichage dans le coin en haut à droite, puis choisissez Vue Gallery. We also have English and French captioning available for this program. You can access English captions using the MIDI controls at the bottom of your Zoom window or by clicking on the link provided in the chat. To access French captions, click on the link provided in the chat. Nous offrons également des sous-titres en anglais et en français. Vous pouvez accéder aux sous-titres en anglais à l'aide des contrôles de la réunion au bas de votre écran Zoom ou en cliquant sur le lien fourni dans le chat. Pour les sous-titres en français, cliquez sur le lien fourni dans le chat. The museum is located on ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory. The Red River Valley is also the birthplace of the Métis. We acknowledge with gratitude the water in the museum is sourced from Shaw Lake 40 First Nation. Le musée se trouve sur des terres ancestrales sur les territoires visés par le traité numéro 1. La vallée de la rivière Rouge est également le berceau du peuple Métis. Nous reconnaissons avec gratitude que l'eau du musée provient de la Première Nation Shaw Lake numéro 40. At CMHR, we are committed to engaging our audiences in respectful dialogue by providing a safe space for all. We welcome your participation with comments and questions. We ask that you stay on topic and be respectful of others as if you were having a face-to-face -face discussion. Thank you for respecting the rights, differences and opinions of others. Au musée, nous sommes résolus à engager nos publics dans un dialogue respectueux en offrant un espace sûr pour tout le monde. Partagez vos commentaires et vos questions. Nous vous demandons de rester dans le sujet, de respecter les autres, comme si vous aviez une discussion face à face. Merci de respecter les droits, les différences et les opinions des autres. You can use the Q&A section to send your questions for our speakers and our moderators. It will be open during the presentation and the Q&A section of the program. To ask a question, open the Q&A window, type your question in the Q&A box and click send. We will try to respond to as many questions as possible by text in the Q&A window or in the live presentation. Vous pouvez utiliser la fonction QR pour envoyer vos questions à nos intervenants et aux modérateurs. Cette fonction sera ouverte pendant la présentation et la période des questions. Pour poser une question, ouvrez la fenêtre QR, tapez votre question dans le case et cliquez sur le bouton pour, pour nous l'envoyer. Nous essaierons de répondre à autant de questions que possible par texte dans la fenêtre QR 
ou en direct pendant la présentation. It is a privilege to connect with you for our virtual program today, which in Canada marks Genocide Remembrance, Condemnation and Prevention Month. C'est un privilège pour nous de communiquer avec vous pour notre programme virtuel aujourd'hui, qui marque au Canada le mois de la commémoration de la condemnation et de la prévention de génocide. Now let me introduce our moderators, Gary and Andrea Dick. Gary and Adria lived in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region of Canada, which is also known as East Turkestan from 2008 until 2018. They did five years of language and cultural studies in Mandarin and Uyghur, and in the last five years, ran a large scale compost business as a social enterprise to assist low income farmers. Gary is now executive director of the Mennonite Heritage Village in Steinbach, Manitoba. Andrea is a family coach and child development educator. She's currently working on her master's in counseling psychology. Permettez-moi maintenant de vous présenter les modérateurs Gary et Andrea Dick. Gary et Andrea ont vécu dans la région autonome Ouïghour de Xinjiang en Chine, également connue sous le nom de Turkestan oriental de 2008 à 2018. Ils ont fait 500 des études linguistiques et culturelles en mandarin et en Ouïghour et durant les cinq dernières années ont géré une entreprise de compostage à grande échelle en tant qu'entreprise sociale pour aider les agriculteurs à faible revenu. Gary est maintenant directeur général du Mennonite Heritage Village of Steinbach, Manitoba. Andrea est coach familiale et éducatrice en développement de l'enfant. Elle travaille actuellement à sa maîtrise en psychologie du counseling. Thank you, Angelique. Uh, yes, we and our three children love living in China and in the Uyghur region in Northwest China. And the Uyghur people, just to let you know, in case you don't, is the Eastern Turkish ethnicity, and they number over 11 million. We were there to uh, see the lead up and the first years of the genocide. Genocide is a process, not a single event. A key feature of the genocidal process is that it is not only a systematic, but also a patterned form of attack on a group. People's real and perceived positions in the target society are instrumentalized by perpetrators to cause maximal and lasting physical and psychic damage to group members and to institutions of group cohesion, especially the family unit. Dr. Jodin Forgi, 2019. In the early stages, we saw increased restrictions, security checkpoints between cities, razor wire on walls, convenience police stations set up at every major intersection. We saw airport level security installed at all stores, parks and restaurants with Uyghurs getting extra scrutiny. We saw the village streets becoming emptier and emptier as 2017 moved along. People taken away are afraid to be noticed. Eventually, very few households still had all of their family members at home. Some were taken to the camps. Others were required to rotate among the village homes, teaching the new restrictions and watching on their fellow Uyghurs. Beards, prayer mats, and religious ceremonies became very suspect. Skirt length and headscarves were scrutinized. In some areas, households were required to buy couches instead of using their traditional floor mats. We saw security checkpoints now coming in between villages. Uh, for myself, driving to work took longer as there were sometimes several roadblocks and police checks. Facial recognition and definition cameras were now more pervasive. Our son's teenage friends were afraid to turn 18 as it meant they would also face the threat of being taken. We saw megaphones and speakers installed on every street so you cannot escape the blaring sounds and anthems of how to behave. Women who had never cut their hair since childhood had to keep their heads bare at the weekly public meetings. They stood there with their hands covering their faces in shame and eventually cut their hair off to comply. Use of electricity and gas was multi uh, monitored. I can no longer buy gas for my van without borrowing a local ID card from someone, which then became risky to that person as no one wanted the follow-up police call for buying too much gas. Walking the streets, there was a strange forced calm. 
The police on the corners and the shop owners along the streets regularly practice drills as though a terrorist attack could happen at any moment. Pedestrians suppressed all emotion to avoid any unwanted attention. One day, as I was going by a market gate, I saw an older man, not allowed in. In frustration, he pushed someone. A signal was given, and within seconds, guards and police vans rushed to the scene and surrounded him. 6 a.m. morning calls began on the suburb and village streets near, we, near where we lived. Police would blow their whistles, and within minutes, everyone had to arrive for their picture. They would all be asked, are you happy? How is your marriage? Is everyone home and happy? We saw a re-education camp just down the street from our home being built and set up. We knew this was not a happy time. Our first presenter today is Dr. Adrian Zenz. Dr. Zenz is a senior research fellow in China studies at the center of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, an education, research, and human rights nonprofit based in Washington, DC. He was one of the first researchers to reveal proof of the situation and the conditions in the Xinjiang camps and has continued to do extensive research on the Uyghur genocide over the years. We're grateful to you, Dr. Zenz, for your work in this area, and we look forward to hearing what you bring to us today. Oh, thank you indeed very much for having me at this event. It's my pleasure to uh, be here and to present. And as I have uh, also said before in the interview with the Globe and Mail, the um, museums have a, a special role to play in this uh, because this is an ongoing atrocity. Um, and even more importantly, it's important to compare this to historical situations and to have the historic awareness um, in order to actually be proactive and prevent atrocities uh, and genocide as they are occurring. And not only to document them when they have long passed and, and the victims are lost. Um, I will be presenting today with a PowerPoint presentation uh, on a number of aspects in relation to this atrocity and how it uh, developed over time. <clears throat> so to start, just a very brief map. There's 11 to 12 million Uyghurs. The total affected population, however, are all Turkic ethnic uh, minorities, including Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, uh, Tajiks, even Hue Muslims, and so on. So we're talking about 15 to 16 million people uh, who are affected by this atrocity. Um, if we look at how it unfolded very briefly, we can sort of see a phase one, 2014 to 16, after the visit of uh, President Xi Jinping, where uh, you had a situation of a police state that was being built up with uh, police recruitments, neighborhood police stations, surveillance systems. Then you had the mass internment in camps uh, from 2017 to 19. Um, and then you had the situation, you have a shift into the long-term strategy, which is forced labor, a separation of children from parents and birth prevention. And, and here we are, of course, looking at a sort of a genocide territory, like there are some boxes here being ticked off the, the United Nations Convention for the Prevention of the Crime of Genocide. So police recruitments, um, Andrea and Gary have, of course, already given a, a much more vivid impression of that than I would be able to. Uh, statistically speaking, you see how in 2009, with the Urumqi riots, uh, police recruitment, this is advertised police positions in Xinjiang per capita, they're per, um, I think this should be 100,000 or 10,000 of the population, um, increased three to four times uh, prior to the previous uh, state. Um, but then under Chen Quanguo, and we are now looking at 2016 and 17, this increased 30 to 40 times of the level of 2007. Uh, Chen Quanguo set up and ramped up the police state, especially in 2016 and 17. He hit the ground running, which is why this was so premeditated. In, in my opinion, we can make a good argument that the police state and the internment campaign is all very premeditated because he he immediately, when he came on to Xinjiang in August 2016, within 12 months, he, he uh, achieved the police state uh, built up. And this was prepar uh, preparation for the subsequent internment campaign to just make sure that um, 
the Uyghurs could not rise up and do anything about the mass uh, internment campaign. Uh, the mass internment campaign, many of these facilities were actually, well, there were inceptions before and in 2016, but many facilities were uh, constructed in 2017. Uh, uh, Uyghurs were often initially rounded up in temporary facilities, even middle schools, and uh, larger, more dedicated facilities were built in 2017 and then 18 and expanded. In 19, here you see a watchtower. This is a German television dri uh, driving past, capturing the watchtower of what's supposedly a vocational training center to, uh, to train Uyghurs in, in good job skills. And here you see in the very center of the satellite image, you see the, the initial phase of the Schule County uh, re-education camp. And the, then the red parts were added later on in 2018 and 19. So a huge massive expansion of internment uh, facilities. And of course, uh, the, the, the one in the bottom um, the bottom right, uh, sorry, the bottom left corner with the blue roofs and the red uh, triangle, um, the red um, circle around it, those are uh, factories. So you're starting to see the first sign of the forced labor here. Moving on, since I don't have a lot of time for this presentation. So what is the long-term strategy here? The long-term, the internment camps themselves are described in an unusually frank Chinese academic research report called the Nankai Report refers to the internment camps as a short-term intensive method, followed by the long-term strategy. What is the long-term strategy? Well, firstly, it's separating parents from children. Secondly, forced labor and labor transfers. And thirdly, birth prevention to limit weaker population growth and make them easier to control. So even preschools, this is a preschool, um, preschool even preschools are like fortresses. Uh, um, I mean, actually this picture could be either preschool or primary school, I can't remember, but the, the point is even preschools, the all schools from preschool to uh, high school are um, equipped with barbed wire, with anti-vehicle barriers, with surveillance systems. Some kindergartens have a three-tiered intrusion detection system with electric fencing. This is a, another close-up from the Associated Press. A primary school. <clears throat> and really what the state is achieving, just to stay here, is a long-term generational change. Break their roots, says one of the documents. Break the roots, break the cultural, the spiritual roots, change them, raise them with the ideology of the party and the government. So this is a long-term change strategy. Of course, in Canada and other places, there have been attempts to do this with native populations. Uh, through colonial schools to change them for good. Demographic genocide. There are uh, documents, the, the chart shows uh, the orange line is Xinjiang's um, sterilizations per 100,000 of the population, shooting up in 2017 and 18, way above the national level, which at this time, China actually um, relaxed birth uh, control uh, regulations and allowed two children instead of just one. Um, local government plans in two weaker counties uh, show plans to sterilize between 14 and 34 percent of women of childbearing age. Uh, just stunning. For 2019, this was. Dramatic declines in natural population growth rates. Um, the Uyghur in, in southern Xinjiang, natural population growth between 2015 and 18 declined by 73 and a half percent, an absolutely incredible a dramatic decline. And in 2019, they have chosen to, long, to no longer publish birth rates, um, only for Xinjiang as a whole, but not by county, not by prefecture. So you can't say. Uh, Kashka also, no, no more uh, publishing of this. One week a region set a, a growth target, a birth rate target of only one per mil, which is nearly zero, uh, for 2020 to be achieved through family planning work. One of the important things is that this, this decline in birth rates cannot just be explained through uh, the internment campaign, but um, it is related to a, a state-sponsored uh, system. So the government has implemented a system and a policy of birth prevention. Uh, of course, the internment camps have further suppressed birth rates, but and that's very important. This is not just a side effect 
of the internment campaign, this is a dedicated policy. And that's where we're looking at the, the intent, the intent to control, even reduce a, a population. Forced labor also plays an important role. Under the guise of development, the, uh, the Chinese state calls it industry-based poverty alleviation. The ethnic minorities are put into so-called poverty alleviation workshops, uh, where they are a place to work either directly from internment camps or generally from labor transfer uh, of uh, agricultural uh, surplus workers. So the, the forced labor is much bigger than the internment. The forced labor impacts uh, more or less most adults, most ethnic minority adults who, from the countryside who were not already in some sort of a full-time wage employment. So it's a very big scheme. And of course, again, the point is to change livelihoods, change control, uh, place Uyghurs in government controlled environments. They cannot go to the mosque on Friday. They can't fast in a work environment. There's cameras. Uh, some oftentimes they're on highly securitized compounds. And so that is, um, that is part of the long-term strategy uh, of the state to control and change these people. We have heard, you might've heard about textile and cotton. You might've heard about the garment industry, fashion industry being implicated. Well, the, the fashion industry and textile is one of the big targets of the forced labor, the labor transfer policy. It's into a uh, low skilled labor intensive manufacturing uh, mostly textile and garments. They want to have 1 million workers in that by 2023. We're also talking uh, electronics, assembly, low skill, footwear, toys, furniture, handicraft, that kind of thing. Xinjiang, of course, plays an important uh, part, a role in the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, this is also designed to, to basically, it's a business of oppression, really. It's making money off the oppression of the Uyghurs. It makes the police state more, more sustainable because the police state is expensive to maintain. This increases Xinjiang's um, economic base. Estimated 80,000 Uyghurs have been transferred to work in other parts of China between 2017 and 2020. So what can be done? <clears throat> this is an ongoing atrocity, which however has already moved from phase one police state to phase two internment to phase three long-term strategy uh, through birth prevention, parent-child separation and forced labor. Governments must condemn this atrocity. And I think it's very important that governments, that it's not just the parliaments who do this, which is important, but also the governments themselves formally recognize the nature of this atrocity um, and force multilateral institutions such as the United Nations to, to acknowledge, to actually even talk about it. Uh, this has been a huge problem. Secondly, the business of oppression of forced labor must be stopped. Here, consumers can do things. Anybody can actually contribute this to this. Um, right to companies, uh, increase awareness. Um, I think here, there's the reliance on politicians and politics drops a little bit. And I think that's very important. Probably one of the reasons why China actually is suing me over forced, my forced labor research because it actually hits them where it hurts economically. Um, and, and it's actually possibly in the long run the bigger problem for them because regular Western consumers can act on this. Atrocity appraisals by governments or United Nations followed by sanctions. <clears throat> it's important that governments fully speak out about the nature of this atrocity. Um, and declared for what it is, but then also follow this up with action. I think sanctions are appropriate because they send a signal. And I think it's important to see um, none of these measures, these, all of these measures may or may not change the situations for the weaker on the ground, like improve, uh, lead to tangible improvement. But that's not the point. You know, I think if the Uyghurs who are languishing in hopelessness know that the world cares about them and talks about them and knows about them and does something, even some, something symbolic like sanctioning uh, the party officials responsible. That by itself is so important. It's so important sometimes just to do the right thing. And then we have to leave the ramifications up to the justice that's hopefully built into our, our society and, 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 and world. Um, and over the long run, you never know what can happen if you do the right thing. Uh, ultimately, this is an ongoing atrocity, and if all of us do the right thing, 
we can really make a difference in this. Imagine if people had done this in 1939 to 45. Imagine what difference could have been made. We are in the midst of this and we have so much more information than people had in 1942 in regards to the Jews. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. That was wonderful. We really appreciate the, your work. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very good for all of us to know. And thank you for uh, kind of distilling in four key areas, uh, the Uyghur plight. Now, we, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce Mehmet Todi. Uh, Mr. Todi is a prominent Uyghur Canadian activist who has campaigned for the rights of Uyghurs over a decade. He is a co-founder of the World Uyghur Congress and executive director of the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project based in Ottawa. I have been following his work the past couple of years and find him to be a wise, thoughtful, ardent person to whom we should listen carefully. Welcome here, Mr. Todi. Uh, thank you, Gary, and thank you, Angelica, and thank you for Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And I remember that I, I worked hard in 2006, 2007, just a campaign for the establishment of museum. And it is nice to be back and to share the same uh, podium. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Adrian and uh, Dr. Adrian Zen for his excellent uh, presentation. Uh, the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project is Ottawa-based uh, research, uh, documentation and advocacy project. Uh, we work for, uh, we, we do research and we doc document on the basis of our research and also on the basis of the documentation, we do advocacy work and we share our resources with Uyghur organizations and other activists and the researchers around the world. And today uh, we are talking about Uyghur family destruction, genocidal tool of Chinese government. And uh, a little while ago, and uh, Gary, yourself, you mentioned about the destruction of Uyghur family unit. And also Dr. Adrian Zenz talked about uh, the mass internment and uh, mass displacement. And at the end, uh, we have to realize that these policies are affecting the families, family integrity and the family foundation. And the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project, uh, we researched, we studied more than 600 family files of Uyghur victims. We collected uh, since 2018 till now. And uh, after our year and a, a year and a half studying of these files, you can see the files here. And this is, by the way, it is volunteer submission. We did not ask any Uyghurs to submit. Uh, and we did not give them any format, what kind of information should be uh, included in their testimony. This is a purely volunteer based submission. And we receive it and we kept in a confidential base and we uploaded all the information to secure system. And we studied nearly 600 family file, files just to figure out what kind of atrocities uh, they, are, uh, they have gone through and are still going through. And after, we, after our study, we found that uh, the Uyghur family destruction is underreported, uh, the genocidal tool of the Chinese government through family separation. And I have to make it clear, we are, when we talk about family separation, it is the process. The end goal of family separation is the destruction of Uyghur families and how it happens it happens through family separation, by interning the millions of, of them in concentration camps and the prisons and the lengthy imprisonment. And the refusal to issue passports or a confiscation of passports uh, from those already have it, or visa refusal and the preventing family reunification. And we are talking about family separation through course divorce and the Chinese government forced people, the Uyghurs inside and the divorce their partners living outside. And the family separation through enforced disaffiliation of family members living abroad, just denunciation of family members. 
disown on the family members. And uh, especially recently, we have seen more propaganda videos by the Chinese government and uh, uh, putting one family member against another or disaffiliating them. Uh, you are not my son, you are not my brother, please don't disturb our life. Uh, we see a lot of uh, Chinese government's propaganda video recently. And also we are talking about family separation through enforced disappearance. I just, I have to mention that uh, there is one uh, Xinjiang uh, database and uh, shahidbiz.com. Uh, since 2017 till 2020, they have received more than 10,500 the testimonies about their missing family members, all of them enforced uh, as a result of enforced disappearance. And the Human Rights Watch and other uh, human rights organizations documented uh, since uh, 2009. And also we are talking about uh, the family separation through displacement. Uh, display, uh, the Dr. Adrian Zen uh, just mentioned about that. Just uh, displacing the young Uyghur male and the female in reproductive ages and uh, spreading them uh, outside of their, their homes, uh, some um, in majority cases, uh, scattering them all across China and forcing, forcing them to work in, under semi military control. And we are talking about family separation of state appointed ethnic. Chinese in homestay program. Homestay means sleep, live, eat together and share on the same bed. And finally, we are talking about family destruction through mass gang rape of Uyghur male and female detainees. And so these are the forms of family separation with the end result or intended goal of family destructions. And so this is the result, not only from our study, from uh, the victim testimonies, at the same time, some of them, uh, uh, it is the result of our direct interviews with the, the camp survivors and the credible uh, reports. And so uh, because of the time limit, I cannot present all of the, the slides. Uh, uh, we are going to publish this report very soon. Uh, and so instead, I would like to share uh, the two testimonies. And one testimony is about just recent one a Canadian gentleman whose name is Kamal Torson. He's a Canadian citizen. He came to Canada in 2003 and he left uh, his hometown in 1999. And recently uh, the doctor G. Levin from Alberta, he wrote the letter to immigration. To Canada immigration, I'm writing this letter with regards to Kamal Thurston, who was admitted to the hospital on April 7, 2021, and has been diagnosed with terminal neurological disease. Mr. Thurston would like to see his daughter, Gulgina Kamal, who lives in China. He has not seen her since leaving China. And basically, just this person wants to see her daughter before his last breath as a Canadian, because Chinese government did not issue a passport for her daughter, for his daughter, and separated this family. And this family is devastating. This gentleman is hospital bed right now in terminal ill. And uh, there, uh, I would like to read another one testimony. My name is Tahir Emin. I live in Washington, DC. I left China in February, 2017, to study at Haifa University in Israel. Chinese authorities asked me to go back to China in May, 2017. I continued my studies and went to US in August, 2018. After I came to US, my wife was forced to divorce me and was constantly interrogated because of me. Since then, I lost all contact. And that there are a lot of testimonies like this. And what does it tell to us? What is the end goal of these forms of family separation? It's the destruction of Uyghur families and the Uyghur family unit uh, in the part of the government mandated program, just to break the lineage, break the roots, break the connections, break the origin. And so this is the translated format of those doctrine into daily politics. And so uh, 
many of time, often times uh, we read the media report about the missing family members, but we really do not go deep. What is the end result of this family separation? And so basically Chinese government is using uh, family separation to achieve the uh, Uyghur family destruction and using it as a genocidal tool. And uh, so some of the, the forms of family separation or uh, the acts that Chinese government committed, it is the part of not only uh, the part of the genocide definition, at the same time, it is part of uh, crime against humanity. And so at the end, what we can do, and we have to be very mindful. And this program is explicitly declared by the Chinese government and vigorously being implemented with mandate by mobilizing all state actors, just like all level of governments. At the same time, non-state actors, just like companies, public sectors, telecom, or other. And so this is the integrated policy by the government, just targeting uh, core foundation of Uyghur families uh, through separation and uh, through breast prevention and others, ultimately destroying the Uyghur family unity and the family integrity, family structures. And so uh, now today, uh, probably I have to mention here, uh, UK parliament also unanimously passed the resolution uh, acknowledging the atrocities committed by Chinese government against Uyghurs as a genocide and a crime against humanity. Our parliament has also voted on February 22nd and acknowledged what is happening, what is going on is genocide. And now uh, with the public pressure and uh, with the awareness raising uh, like this, we have to call our government to take action. The start, uh, starting from, uh, they have to uh, start uh, first acknowledging uh, the atrocity as genocide. After the acknowledgement, we have a better chance to work with our allies and other partners to convince them to acknowledge and then take some concrete action because we have a legal obligation after we acknowledge the genocide, we have a legal obligation to stop it and to punish those who are responsible for those crimes at the same time we have a responsibility to protect those victims. Maybe we cannot do anything so uh, in our within uh, current capacity to those who are living in China, but at least we can do something while living outside. And for that reason, uh, we have to look into our family reunification program and the immigration of Canada should review because some family reu reu reunification program takes long time to process. And especially at this time as Chinese government uh, creates all kinds of uh, hurdle in the process, it, is, it became almost impossible to achieve family reunification. And we have to look into some other options and also we have to look into our internal uh, regulations and oftentimes we ask the family members when they sponsor, we ask tons of information, which is impossible right now to obtain from Chinese government. And we have to uh, look into those regulations and uh, we have to make some adjustments. And uh, this is the issue that uh, we have to address as of now, at least there are people still, we can uh, extend our helping hands and save them from the atrocities. And uh, it affects uh, uh, the generational, uh, uh, this, this has a generational impact, uh, not only the Uyghurs inside and the, at the same time Uyghurs outside, just from myself since 1991, I'm totally isolated from my mother and the siblings and all of my close or uh, indirect relatives as a result of this family separation policy. So we have to address this and we have to uh, adjust our policies and help those victims. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Todi. Yes, when we lived there, we saw we were there in the first stage in the earlier stages and we saw a constant threat of separation women i knew were kept so busy with overnight work requirements marching and extra work they couldn't go home to feed their children 
a woman I knew was responsible to care for the elderly parents and young children in her extended family. And once she was taken to a camp, life became impossible for that family. Even those who weren't taken to the camps were living in separation because of extra requirements. And those still at home faced the constant threat of being sent off to schools. One woman was talking to me and just said, all day at work, I hear employers saying, if you don't do this, I send you to the schools. If you don't do this, I send you to the schools. Yeah. And uh, I have some breaking news here. The uh, UK Parliament, they were having their vote actually today uh, about the genocide in, in Xinjiang. And uh, I'm happy to announce that they voted unanimously to declare China's treatment of Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang region as genocide. Uh, so that follows in the in the wake of US, Canada, Netherlands, and so we're we're happy to announce that today. Now we will open it up uh, for for the interaction here for your questions. We thank you. Uh, the questions have been coming in, and we appreciate your interest. And uh, yeah, we want to keep going through with this discussion and and uh, with Adrian and Mehmet. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Zenz, one person has asked, um, what kind of birth prevention, what does that look like? So the goal, um, according to government documents, is uh, quote-unquote long-term effective birth prevention. And in southern Xinjiang, that typically refers to the insertion of intrauterine devices, which are non-removable. They can be removed only uh, by government-approved clinics or uh, tubal ligation sterilizations. In some cases, it would also refer to um, to like a medication, but uh, those that would be sort of the typical method. We have also some quantitative evidence uh, for that uh, from uh, a number of counties. And uh, Mr. Toti, um, do any nations have the, the incentive they need, the courage they need uh, to deal uh, with China on, on this genocide? Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, there is, uh, we, we see some awakening movement right now uh, from United States and Canada, as you just announced uh, from UK and then Netherlands and other countries. At least this topic is under discussion and increasing level in the political level. And also there is a great push for uh, relevant uh, institutions of United Nations to address this. And also uh, there is some, uh, the, the Chinese government at home also is uh, increasingly feeling this pressure. And so uh, I think uh, from Canadian perspective, I can uh, talk more about from Canadian perspective. And I, uh, the, a recently announced sanction, I guess it is the first step and uh, we have to adjust uh, many of our the policies that we set previously and we call status quo. And it takes some time to address, address uh, that policy at the same time to implement a new set of uh, trade policy with China and a new set of uh, other uh, uh, the, the, the dimensional uh, change in relation to China. So I think this is the big, uh, the process of, uh, it is the beginning and uh, this process is, uh, should continue. And uh, with the increasing pressure, I think within uh, the next year, probably we are going to see more actions from uh, our international allies. Yeah, I've heard different governments uh, talk about, you know, we need to work collaboratively about this. Yeah, definitely not, not one country on one country, yeah. but uh, Another question came in about um, the the people living in uh, the people living in the uh, the Uyghur village homes, the Han going around, and the different people that had to to live in the, in the homes. Family um, programs. Yeah, and the person asking the question said, "Is it's quite alarming that these people would be sleeping with children and and being in the home as they watch." Um, if people are speaking Mandarin in the home and and these things and I I felt it was very very alarming a lot of these homes the the husband has already been taken off to a camp and so it's uh it's unspeakable how alarming that would be for a, a Muslim family to to have lost privacy to that extent Uh, Dr. Adrian, here's one for you. Uh, someone was wondering uh, about the testimonies, or, or Mehmet too. Where, 
where can they find these testimonies uh, that you both talked about? So I can just be very brief here because I work uh, really primarily with government documents and not really primarily with testimonies. But the testimonies that I work with are uh, published. Uh, most recently, a very detailed uh, testimony was published by the New Yorker magazine. Uh, and uh, testimonies, for example, of women specifically related to birth prevention, forced sterilization, etc., were published by the Associated Press in uh, the summer of last year, together with my article, and then also by The Guardian. Yeah, uh, we are going to uh, uh, the release our report within a maximum two weeks' time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, whoever interested, uh, they have a chance to read the original Uyghur testimony and uh, the exact translation into English version. And for safety and security reason, for the uh, protection of uh, identity of those uh, pe uh, victims, and uh, we have to blur the names and the, some uh, specific identification of those uh, victims and the rest of them. Uh, it will be included our uh, the report that would be published within two weeks. They can visit uh, www.urap.ca, urap.ca, or a first letter of Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project. <clears throat> Thank yeah. you. One um, attendant has asked, Dr. Zenz, are you reading these documents in Chinese? How are you accessing them? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I work entirely in Chinese in my research, both in searching them and in reading them. And um, uh, sometimes when I do one one to one translation, um, I um, use the help of my um, native Chinese speaking research assistant. But my work is conducted in Chinese, which actually is, is one of the reasons why I was uh, more obscure as a researcher for a long time, because I don't speak ethnic minority languages. So in a sense, uh, doing Chinese-based research was for a long time a disadvantage until uh, this came around. So you don't know Uyghur, I guess, right? No, Yeah. which is strange, uh, but, but now it's a huge, well, it's not a benefit not to speak Uyghur, but it's a huge benefit to have done all this work in Chinese. And that's why I also find these things because I've done this for many years in Chinese. We have another question here. Um, perhaps both of you could answer this one as well. Do the Uyghur people have political representation and what means of advocacy do they have on the ground? Uh, just let me go first uh, with your permission, Dr. Zen. And I don't know just uh, what uh, that person means, uh, the inside of East Turkestan or outside of East Turkestan. So the, uh, the answer depends upon uh, the uh, what he means. And uh, inside of East Turkestan, no, there is no political representation. And uh, it is the Chinese Communist Party, single party system, and the Chinese central government appointed uh, puppets uh, there for showcase. For outside of uh, China, yes, there is uh, a Uyghur organization, and then uh, notably the World Uyghur Congress uh, representative body working with uh, all Uyghur organizations, as umbrella organization, working with all Uyghur organizations across the globe. And basically, uh, they have uh, uh, the mission uh, to achieve. One is promotion of the rights of Uyghur people and uh, to protect their culture and the rights at the same time, uh, seek uh, the political solutions through a dialogue and a nonviolent way. Uh, to secure the rights of Uyghur people that, to determine their own political future. And if you uh, visit the UyghurCongress.org, you can see the mission statement and what that organization is doing. It is open source information. Dr. Zenz, did you have a response to that question? Do the Uyghur people have political representation and what means of advocacy do they have on the ground? On the ground? <laughs> Um, they are liable to be put into uh, police custody or an internment camp if, as the dicks have um, shared themselves, uh, if they happen to accidentally trip over the foot of a police officer. I don't think much more needs to be said about their political representation in China. Of course, uh, the Chinese ethnic minority system has, of course, a system of autonomy 
uh, autonomous region and an autonomous government. So you have a, an ethnic minority governor, you have a Uyghur governor, Tibetan governor, and then a Chinese party secretary. And the one who has the power is the party secretary. And I've actually argued in my own uh, past research over 10 years ago that um, ethnic in, in Tibetans have to some extent succeeded in using uh, some of that system to their benefit. Very, it's very, even back then it was very difficult, very, very challenging before Xi Jinping. And under Xi Jinping, of course, that all changed very rapidly. And now Xinjiang is a, uh, Xinjiang is a complete uh, police state and Uyghurs are co-opted in the system. So Uyghurs, you, you'll see Uyghur politicians uh, saying that Uyghurs are doing great and these camps are just really wonderful places where people play basketball. Yeah, just um, the, a lot of the police that were marching on the streets and, and things that we saw were a lot of them were Uyghurs being used for that role. There was, and like I said, they're, they're often look so calm, everyone's calm on the streets. There was one day I was walking to the shops and I saw a line of eight of these young men marching in uniform. And there was one man that just stuck out to me, his face was not calm and he looked embarrassed and frightened and it just, it just has, his face has, has stuck out to me. Um, Mehmet Tori, how are the uh, Uyghurs in Canada doing? Um, and, you know, one question specifically too after that is, is, is there lobbying to the federal government to push for Uyghur family reunification? Yeah. Uh... The Uyghurs uh, and working on their behalf in Ottawa, and we have been working with our parliamentarians, uh, elected officials at the same time with uh, all level of uh, government officials. Uh, just to promote the rights of Uyghur people and uh, uh, creating awareness about this genocide. It took some while and at least uh, now there is some uh, action from political level, especially from parliamentary level. And for government, I think now with the, the new administration in the United States and the Canadian government seems to be more emboldened. And uh, they have ongoing problem with China, especially for our two Michaels and the other uh, detained Canadians. Now with the backing of United States and uh, uh, it's time for Canada to take much uh, stronger action. And because nearly 90% of Canadians, they have a certain sort of views against China. At the same time, they supported uh, the parliamentary acknowledgement of Uyghur genocide. In this case, uh, the parliament has spoken and the Canadian public also spoken and it's time to, for government to take the uh, already announced action into next level. So what, um, what can, can Canadians do to, to come alongside the things, the advice that you're giving? Uh, uh, Dr. Zen uh, had a pointed number of suggestions and uh, I, uh, I, I, I would like to thank all Canadians uh, for their support and a recent poll uh, showed more than 83% of Canadians already support the parliamentary motion acknowledging Uyghur genocide. That is uh, uh, good, really uh, uh, it is uh, comforting uh, for the sufferer of Uyghurs. And so uh, we have to push, we have to contact with our elected uh, the federal and the provincial MPs, even city councillors, and to take some drastic measures and to review their current China policy. At the same time, on personal level, as Dr. Uh, Adrian Zenz mentioned, we have to be more vigilant and uh, we have to exercise due diligence, what we are consuming and what kind of products we are buying and uh, with our pocket money that they can go to somewhere to support the forced labor and the genocide. And for that reason, not only textile sectors, at the same time, uh, the tomato sectors, we have to be more uh, careful. We have to check where it is made. At the same time now, uh, the solar panel and the polysilicon and uh, uh, that area also, we have to be uh, very vigilant and especially government should revisit the, uh, the, the January announcement of uh, uh, 
they are advisory and they have to uh, put some uh, concrete measures, uh, enforceable measures to stop the importation of those products from uh, the Uyghur region to Canada. And unless uh, strong public support and the government sometimes uh, is quite reluctant to act and we have to increase that pressure. Mm. So these are the areas that uh, our uh, fellow Canadians can be more active. Yeah, and then based on that too, uh, Dr. Zenz, are there, someone's asking where the specific corporations that are using forced labor, uh, where can they be found, just so we know what companies are part of that? Uh, so uh, there is a, a website called the Uyghur Coalition to End Forced Labor, or the Coalition to End Forced Uyghur Labor. Uh, if you Google that, um, that they will have some up-to-date information. Um, the only other way is to look at uh, media reports. Uh, to stay up to date with media reports and, and research, uh, but the research will typically be mentioned in media reports and they will name names. And it's a moving target and um, a couple of companies have been named. Uh, so yeah, I think that's one centralized website that collates the information and staying up to date with media developments and um, so, yeah, what, what related, acti these weaker activists and others have uh, social media accounts including people like Mehmet Tohti and, mm -hmm. and the World Uyghur Congress, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, uh, and they will tweet out and share information as it mm -hmm. comes out. Thank you, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Zenz, in your opinion, here's another question. In your opinion, why is so-called Muslim and Turkic speaking states, why do they remain silent on the Uyghur genocide? What will it take to change the situation? So you have to, so these are governments, right? Uh, it's the governments who stay silent. So you have to look at them and their motivation. Now, many of these governments, one can say about 90% of them have very little interest in human rights, even in their own country. Uh, to the contrary, some of them are actually uh, uh, human rights violators. Many of these governments uh, don't have no interest in helping uh, even other Muslims if, if, if it can hurt their own pocket. And China's Belt and Road Initiative happens to actually uh, be influential in much of the Muslim world. The Belt and Road goes right through the Middle East, South, Southeast Asia, etc. Um, you even unfortunately have democracies where people are surprising, Muslims are surprisingly silent. Uh, the Muslim world itself sometimes proclaims that it speaks out for each other, but when the rubber hits the road, meaning uh, it's very easy to condemn uh, cartoonists in France or Denmark, right? You, you lose no money if you do that. You can even threaten to kill them. Uh, so, sorry for being blunt. <laughs> but um, if you, however, anger the government of China, uh, many of these countries are facing potentially substantial financial ramifications because they know that China will not be happy. And it's a very sensitive topic for Beijing. Behind the scenes, China is using a huge amount of influence and probably money to threaten, coerce, and, 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 and influence these voices and these governments, and they're falling for it. So we are, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a classic case of self-interest. Uh, I think that's the most straightforward explanation. Okay, and then to take it down more to a kind of a personal individual level, uh, Mr. Tori, um, can you talk about how expat Uyghurs, you know, the di diaspora, are being intimidated by, by maybe Chinese authorities or others? Yeah. Uh... Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the topics that we have been raising with our, Can uh, with our uh, Canadian officials since almost 20 years. And uh, I just, uh, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, in my case, uh, just uh, I, I myself isolated uh, since 1991 from my families and without any visit each other. And uh, the many Uyghur activists and many Uyghurs, uh, they have been experiencing this. And uh, uh, the hostage taking was the terminologies that they used by Uyghurs uh, 10 years ago. And uh, now uh, we are using that terminology for two Michaels. And uh, basically Chinese government uh, in, uh, in many cases is a common practice, taking hostage of our family members and uh, compelling their members living abroad to obey the Chinese rule, Chinese uh, laws, or stay silent, uh, abstaining themselves from taking part 
uh, any rally that uh, goes against uh, China or oppressed protesting against China. And sometimes the, uh, uh, the Uyghurs in Canada are receiving a direct phone call from Public Security Bureau and uh, with the presence of their uh, parents or family members or sometimes uh, the wife or the husband or children. Uh, as, as a result of hostage taken and directly threatening them. And, uh, and now uh, we have seen that uh, they are shifting uh, their policy. And in Canada, there are a lot of infiltrated uh, forces or people that are actively working for the agenda of the Chinese government as part of academia or a political circle. And uh, we have seen in, in the media report uh, frequently. And so, uh, this is the ongoing issue. Unfortunately, in our federal government, there is no any piece of legislation to address this specific issue. And uh, recently we had one tip line and uh, it's a phone line. It is general tip line, but it doesn't solve the problem. And this is the area that our federal government should address. And there is a warning from our CSIS officials top level since 2010, as far as I remember about the Chinese infiltration in our system, not only the threat, intimidation and harassment from China at the same time here in Canadian soil. And this is the serious issue that our government should address and our politicians and the parliamentarians should look into it. And just, we need to pass a number of legislation just like Foreign uh, Transparency Act or a Foreign Agent Registry Act as Australia and some other countries did. And unfortunately we are uh, dragging behind on this, uh, on this critical issue. Dr. Zenz, can you say more about uh, what specific legal actions are being advanced to UN courts, criminal or international court of justice, and who's leading that? Uh, the International Criminal Court of Justice in The Hague uh, received a um, request to uh, prosecute or look into the situation uh, of the Uyghurs through treaty countries. China is not a uh, party of the ICC and cannot be directly um, uh, implicated. So they tried to do this through Tajikistan, another country, and uh, there needs more research needed to be done. So there needs to be this legal link through Uyghur refugees in countries like Cambodia and Tajikistan. And uh, the court said there wasn't enough evidence at the moment, um, because dedicated research had, has not been done yet on, on that particular act of Uyghurs being expatriated and at risk by being deported from Tajikistan, Cambodia and other countries. And so at the moment, and the United Nations is really paralyzed. I mean, look at this. Uh, China got a free pass for the human rights uh, review uh, at the end of 2018. Uh, they got, and, and that was, uh, you know, uh, end of 2018 when they first had to admit that there were camps and people were in the camps uh, and um, countries acquitted them. So China is really good at elite capture, playing the game at the United Nations and working by numbers. Uh, influencing large numbers of smaller countries or developing countries or outright authoritarian countries uh, who are not interested in human rights. And so United Nations has become actually a, an incredibly important mechanism uh, to uh, act on any human rights violation in China, uh, and much, much less to speak of a determination of crimes against humanity or genocide or anything. And so um, at the moment, one of the more promising initiatives is uh, not associated with a governmental institution, is the Uyghur Tribunal, uh, the Uyghur Genocide Tribunal, uh, that's going to start its hearings in London in early June. Yeah. So that's, I think, as far as I can tell, the situation. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, an interesting question, too, uh, about Olympics. Is boycotting the 2022 Olympics an effective strategy? I know uh, in February, when it came up to the parliament vote here in Canada, it, uh, Olympics was also talked about at the parliament level, and uh, there was some afterwards to talk about what we do as a nation. And um, I think, yeah, it's, we've seen that, you know, we were there in 2008 when they had the last summer Olympics in Beijing, and we saw some things, and uh, I don't see this in the news, but this is uh, the insider perspective that I think Andrea will share a little bit here first, and then I want Adrian and Mehmet to share what they think. So when when 2008 happened, we saw a lot of increased restrictions, just even off in Xinjiang, even though it's the other side of the country, there were increased security measures. 
Um, other times when there were important meetings, like the fall of 2017, there were meetings in Beijing and and in our part of the country, in Xinjiang, the the restrictions just ramped up. Suddenly there could not be any knives used. We couldn't get a chicken butchered because the butchers weren't allowed to use knives. And large semi-trucks on the roads became illegal um, for that week and, and all the produce in the greenhouses rotted. So it just affects people around the country uh, when there's sort of a security thing happening. Dr. Yeah. Zenz, did you want to comment on this question? Is boycotting the 22 Olympics an effective <laughs> strategy or not? I would rephrase the question. I think it's sometimes very good to look at a, a measure in terms of its effectiveness. How would you define effectiveness? Effectiveness in getting weakest released from camps? Uh, no. I would rephrase the question as follows. I would ask, how could you hold the Olympics in a country that is doing this, if you are human? Yeah. We all know, <clears throat> you know how hard um, athletes work and train. And we're not comparing this to the Germany games of 1936, because in 1936, the world really didn't know what was going on. And there was maybe one concentration camp. I don't know exactly. Um, we're comparing this to Germany in 1942. I don't know. I, I just think, I mean, seriously, how, how could we? What, what do the Olympics stand for? What are they about? You know, do you want to hold a sports event? Do you want to, uh, do you want to, I mean, if the Olympics are about anything, then how could we hold them in Beijing in 2022? That's all I want to say. Thank you so much. Um, I feel that it would put people at further risk, but the risk is already immeasurably high. We have another question here. Shouldn't Canadians and fashion companies be made aware that clothing and fabrics and other products made in China could come from these Uyghur internment workshops. Buying these products supports in a way the genocidal measures. Yeah, I mean, we kind of have touched on it, but um, yes, the supply chain and products, that's, that's a, a really big topic now. And in my opinion, it's now the governments who need to step in, yeah. right? So China is, China is even uh, retaliating against companies like H&M and Nike who put out statements saying, oh, there's forced labor in Xinjiang, we're not sourcing from there anymore. If this is about Western governments have to take measures to uh, stop imports that are made, uh, that could be made with forced labor. The yeah. uh, United States has gone ahead. Other countries need to follow. Yeah. Steps taken so far by Canada, uh, are ins completely insufficient, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So consumers can do something, of course. It's a moving target as well, you know. So it's better if a government just really does the due diligence and preemptively, even if you shut down anything from Xinjiang, that's the right thing to do at the moment because there's the rebuttable presumption. There's, there's the risk, right? It's a police state with internment camps, forced labor programs, labor transfer. So you, could, you just have to, it's better to be preemptive and say no to the whole thing. And then if somebody can prove otherwise, because I think that's also one of the ways that China can be influenced yeah. in some way. Absolutely agree. And uh, but especially um, uh, since the announcement of uh, uh, government of Canada's uh, on January uh, 12th announcement or advisory on the companies, just calling them to exercise due diligence. It is kind of childish how those companies can exercise due diligence. And let's say uh, one nice gentleman is sitting as a CEO of one Canadian company who wants to exercise due diligence, how, do you, how he can do that. Can he uh, send some uh, investigation team to the area and they check each step of supply chain, which part is uh, tainted with the forced labor? Does China allow that to happen? And so this is the job for the government and uh, we have to take enforceable measures and we have to issue a full ban as United States did. If there is more than 80% or 90% chance of some of the products like cotton or tomato related products already tainted with the forced labor, what else we are looking for? And what kind of due diligence you ask on the companies to exercise? 
it is the job of the government. And otherwise, it is morally unacceptable for me. And I have a young boy and sometimes I have, I find myself extremely difficult to find something, the closing to my baby that is not made in China. It is embarrassment. It is sometimes I have to uh, look around number of shops just to find one piece of clothing. And uh, tainted, forced labor tainted products are full everywhere in Canadian uh, shopping malls. And how we can continue to consume those products. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, uh... Yeah, what is the Chinese, we'll end with this question and then let you share your own thoughts too to conclude, but what is the Chinese government reaction to the various countries of condemning their policies in Xinjiang? Yeah, Adrian is the best person to answer this. <laughs> Attack researchers, try to portray, portray them as extreme right wing, uh, you know, which is really funny. Um, you know, you know, I, I vote for Angela Merkel typically, although she's actually going out. So I don't know yeah. if that makes me uh, an extreme <laughs> right wing. I don't think it does. But uh, <laughs> I don't think I can vote for the party anymore, though, because of their, their China, their foreign policy of yeah, the CEU yeah. is a, yeah. a huge disaster at the moment. And I, I think their new leaders actually, anyways, this is not about <laughs> getting <laughs> off topic, but um, seriously, they're just distracting. Um, what aboutism? Oh, you have done human rights problems. You know, never mind. George Floyd's murderer was actually convicted and is going to prison. You know, yeah. whereas the people who are uh, doing these things against the Uyghurs are, are being celebrated and promoted politically. So um, China is hitting back. Uh, China is increasingly aggressive. It's do doing not just tit for tat, but doing uh, multiple tits for tat mm -hmm. and um, counter sanctioning people, including myself, uh, academics, politicians, others, um, trying to target Western companies who have said, oh, there's a forced labor problem. Uh, we no longer source from Xinjiang. Um, coercing countries like Sweden, smaller countries like Sweden or Australia, who are trying to say something about different things. And if, and of course, they're also intimidating other, uh, especially Belt and Road countries and, and countries who are benefiting financially Kazakhstan, for example, uh, many uh, witnesses or former camp detainees are, are Kazakh and were able to return to Kazakhstan, flee Xinjiang, and are now being detained by Kazakh security forces, beaten up by unknown uh, street gangs, um, stuff like this. Uh, it, China is pulling levers and is, is um, effectively leveraging its economic might. We've heard about the threatening of Uyghurs who speak out you know, Radio Free Asia, Uyghurs, their family members in Xinjiang are put in camps simply because these Radio Free Asia Uyghur journalists are, are reporting on the situation. Um, people, it's, it's they're, they're, they are using every means they can, hostage diplomacy in that way, um, and, and now increasingly uh, threatening economic retaliation and other retaliation uh, because of their economic power. But it, it, but they're not just doing that about Xinjiang, they're also doing this on other topics. And so I think uh, it's time for, for democracies in the world, not just the West, anywhere. And we can be open about our mistakes, you know? I mean, yeah, white privilege, yes, racism, yes. Let's tackle, let's tackle our own blind spots and, and injustices at home. But we free countries, we need to uh, just stand together, um, not, not in saber rattling, but in a sober recognition that our own liberties are being threatened and that we have to do something about the Uyghur atrocity, even if China uh, hits back at us. And I think we need to be multilateral. We need to work together, not America first or Canada first or anybody first, but working together uh, calmly and doing good research and doing fact-based advocacy uh, and, and political and diplomatic and other measures. Yeah, let me add a couple of sentences. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Agenzens is absolutely right. And also we have to realize that nearly 70% of the Chinese uh, foreign uh, reserve or a foreign currency reserve is still are coming uh, 
from Canada, US, and the European Union and the Western countries. We have to realize that. And so when China hits back, uh, maybe uh, at some point Canada or some other countries, as Adrian said, when we work together and when we can have uh, some uh, control in our market to get uh, some of the Chinese goods or uh, China made in China products, if we have some control uh, on that area, and it is a big hit to China as well because uh, China is experiencing a shortage of foreign currency right now. And the second uh, thing is, yeah, we shouldn't afraid to hit back. And if we afraid and keep uh, our silence, hey, China is hitting back if we say or do something, just we have to visualize what is going to happen after 10 or 25 years when China gets much stronger and what kind of world our children will be living what kind of world they are waking up after 20 years? I, I, I urge people to ask these questions and our Western values and human rights and the rule of law and uh, freedom, it didn't come that easy. And there was a huge sacrifice during the first and the second world war, nearly millions of life lost. And we established certain value system it is not perfect, but uh, there is a certain value system. And the China is threatening that value system. And the China is exporting its authoritarianism. And the China is expanding uh, uh, its allies on the base of those, uh, its own kind of terms and the value system. And so it's time for our governments to look at this issue seriously, not only from the Uyghurs uh, today's uh, perspective or atrocity perspective, at the same time for our next generation. It's not about billion dollars or the dollar, uh, this for that, that kind of question. It is our future. And so this is much, much serious issue. Yeah, yeah, and on how much trade dollars we can get for the yeah. next couple yeah. of years. Yeah. Yeah, and I know in February when they had that parliament vote, uh, after that vote, uh, there were some accusations or, you know, hey, you you know, the MPs, they've never been here before and they don't know what they're talking about. Well, I mean, there are quite a few of us out there that have been. And, you know, my wife and I, we loved working there. You know, the compost business, uh, you know, just serving the farmers, working with them and, and helping things get better. And that's that's what we want to see. We want to see things that that human dignity uh, together, the, the culture yeah. lifting yeah. that up. So in we're, we're almost to the end here. So just in one one or two sentences, is there one last word that you'd like to share with us, Dr. Zenz and and Mr. Toti? Mr. Toti first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for your experience and the Gary and the address. Thank you, Dr. Zenz, and uh, yeah, uh, frequently uh, sharing uh, the screen. And I hope this will continue. And your work is important. And also our Canadian uh, audience and the listeners, uh, please be proactive. And uh, as I said, uh, please do not forget to check your daily consumption, what you are buying. At the same time, please uh, look at your internet and to check your MP's uh, office and to try to uh, contact with them. And we have to push our uh, legislators to introduce some sort of legislation. And we have to encourage our government to be bold in their action against, uh, or their reaction against Chinese, uh, uh, the ongoing uh, genocide against Uyghurs. Thank you. I would encourage everybody to, um talk about this to make a big deal out of this because I don't think it's being recognized um, for the magnitude of what it constitutes. Social media elsewhere, I mean, do you think, does anybody think that this is getting enough attention given what's going on? I don't think so. No. I think it's time that changes. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that, very good. Today we've heard eyewitness accounts detailed data research, and an extensive report from the Uyghur community. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for taking time with us, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and the Mennonite Heritage Village to hear the Uyghur plight and the largest incarceration of a people since the Holocaust. To close with, I want to read a poem I wrote when tears and prose were not enough to contain what I felt about the re-education camps. 
It's entitled High Ruiz Tombs. You've never seen such high tombstones. They arose this year all around the cities. The graveyards multiplied, and yet there were no shots fired, no outbreak of disease. No, everything here is pretty quiet and tidy. But in that quiet, I can hear the writhing of those under the stones and the crying of those who miss them in the village homes, but not too loudly. Otherwise they too will be taken into these graveyards of high rise tombs. The government calls them re-education schools, but they don't fool me. I see the razor wire, the cameras, the guards on their high walls, thousands, now millions taken in, but never coming out. When will they stop the building of these modern graveyards until there is no one living outside their walls, I fear. That concludes our program. Thank you to our presenters and our moderators. Thank you for joining us from home. The recording of the event will be posted on the CMHR Facebook page once bilingual captions have been added. Keep checking our website and follow us on social media if you want to be alerted to future museum events. I hope you have a great afternoon. Ceci conclut notre programme. Merci à nos intervenants et à nos modérateurs. Merci de vous être joints à nous depuis chez vous. L'enregistrement de l'avènement sera publié sur la page Facebook du musée une fois que les sous-titres bilingues auront été ajoutés. Continuez à consulter notre site web et à nous suivre sur les médias sociaux si vous voulez être informé des futurs événements du musée. Merci. <coughs>